All right, so let's do chapter 22, the GYN case study and anatomy review. So you're dispatched to a private residence for a 40-year-old woman with abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. You arrive to find an apparently healthy middle-aged woman, Maria Medina, laying on her side on the couch with her knees drawn up. All right, patient tells you she's been experiencing spotting for about 10 to 15 minutes and is now having abdominal pain and cramping. She is six weeks pregnant and this is her first pregnancy. She immediately phoned her doctor when the spotting started and then was headed to his office when the pain began. All right, so what are you thinking at this point? All right, so primary assessment shows us that she is anxious and tearful. She is alert. Her airway is open and patent. She's talking to us. The breathing is rapid with adequate tidal volume. What do you think that rapid is from? Uh, at this point, I'd say it's probably from the pain. And then circulation, she has a strong rapid radial pulse. Once again, also probably due to the anxiety and the pain that she is experiencing. All right, so based on this impression and your primary assessment, how would you categorize this patient? All right, so what we're looking for, is she stable, unstable? stable for now but potentially unstable is she in immediate danger uh, for me based on her her mental status her skin signs her vital signs um, I would say that she appears to be fairly stable I don't see any immediate life threats for her all right so I think we need to move along into a little more thorough history taking and assessment stuff right and just be aware condition can always change but that's where I would be sitting with this patient right, as far as assessments what assessments would we want to find out for this patient at this point in time. All right, so we got our vital signs, SpO2, ABCs, that kind of stuff. We also are gonna need to do an abdominal exam, right? We're looking for what, tenderness, scarring, discolorations, distension, rigidity, anything like that. All right, so we get vital signs, we start an IV, we apply the cardiac monitor, we note she's in a sinus rhythm, and as you continue your assessment, she says, please just take me to the hospital. And you can tell she's very frightened, so sister to the stretcher where she finds her position of comfort right level of consciousness she's alert she's cs of 15 skin warm pink and dry pulse 90 beats per minute and regular blood pressure 110 over 68 respirations are 30 per minute and spo2 is 96 percent what other information would you like to have at this point and do you see any issues that you may have that will impact your patient care Okay. Well, you know, obviously we're going to need a sample history, right? We're going to need the OPQRST as far as like the bleeding and the cramping. We're going to need to estimate our blood loss. So we ask, you know, the patient how many number and types of pads or tampons they've used since the spotting began. Um, you know, we need to ask if there's any possibility of recent trauma or infection or, or things of that nature. All right. And as far as impacting, you know, any issues that will impact patient care, she's frightened. All right, so you're gonna have to be compassionate. You're gonna have to be respectful and preserving your modesty. You're gonna have to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. And really just establishing and maintaining that trust with your patient. All right, so you're going to continue to ask questions about Ms. Medina's pain and pregnancy. You focus on orthostatic vitals, perform a focused physical. Uh, you don't see any changes in your positional vital signs. You don't see any signs of shock or trauma. And you know, she seems to be pretty stable, right? En route to the facility, you advise them of her signs and symptoms, any other pertinent information. I don't know why this is in here. Oh, this is a reassessment. Ah, reassessment. Still alert. Warm, pink, and dry. Pulse is now 86 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 110 over 66. And respirations are 24 with a 97% SpO2. So, with all that we've got, a reassessment, all this fun stuff, does she require aggressive pre-hospital care? At this time, there's really no need for aggressive pre-hospital care. Um, you know, she's alert, her blood pressure is okay, she doesn't show any signs of shock, so, you know, if we were expecting maybe like a fallopian tube rupture or something of that nature, then we would probably expect to have like a sudden sharp stabbing pain on a, unilaterally on one side that suddenly became very severe. Um, you may have even some referred pain to the shoulder or something like that. And they would probably show, start showing some signs of hypotension as well. And remember, the ectopic pregnancies do tend to occur about six to eight weeks after the last normal menstrual cycle when they, when they have the issues. So it's certainly a possibility in this case, but I would not think it's as likely, or if it is, it's very early on. All right, so as you get to the hospital, uh, the husband 
greets you and she's taken to the OB wing where her physician awaits her. Right. And right when you get there, vital signs, alert, GCS of 15, pink woman dry, pulse rate's 82, blood pressure 110 over 60, 24, nothing's really changed, okay? So what do you think could be her source of bleeding, cramping, and pain? There can be a lot of cases like this where you don't really know for sure. Or it could be quite a few things. So, you know, differential, differential diagnosis is what we're looking for here. So what should we include in our differentials in the treatment and management of this patient? Miscarriage, obviously, could be one of them. Uh, could have an ovarian cyst that ruptured. Could have a, a trauma um, due to a, a threatened abortion or, um, you know, perhaps intercourse could even cause some spotting or something. So there's there's several different things, you know, and including the potential for ectopic pregnancy that we discussed. So a lot of different things that we want to consider as the possibility when we're looking at these differentials. All right, so with gynecology, this is going to be specifically dealing with diseases in the care of the female reproductive system. It often goes hand in hand with the, the OB portion of it, but this is dealing with the entire reproductive system, whereas the, the OB part is dealing specifically with a pregnant reproductive system. So we've got our ovaries. All right, this is a pair of organs, typically, most people have two, that release the eggs or the ova and the reproductive hormones, okay? And so every month, most months, most women will have where you've got these little follicles that are going to develop and enlarge, and then you're going to have this little ovum that just kind of bursts forth like the alien out of a chest in the Aliens movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Egg releases, burst out, and then these little fimbrae, these little finger-like projections kind of like suck up the egg, and it travels through the fallopian tube down to the actual uterus is where it looks to hopefully implant, it's, you know, if it wants to if it produces, if it meets with the sperm and becomes a blastocyte and all that stuff. But you know, so this is where that happens every single month. Um, now the corpus luteum is what's left over after the egg is released and that's actually what will sustain the pregnancy up until the placenta has developed. The uterus. The uterus is this kind of pear shaped organ and this is where the lining here, this interior Portion, the lining will thicken every month in preparation for a fertilized egg to implant in. And if it does not, then it sheds and that turns into what we know as the menstrual cycle. So, a couple terms here, the fundus. The fundus is this upper portion here, right, this upper portion. And you can actually, in a pregnant state, you can actually palpate that and feel it. In a non-pregnant state, we're not going to be able typically to palpate the fundus there. All right, the walls of the uterus are going to have your myometrium and your endometrium right here. All right, the, as far as the rest of it, the neck of the uterus, the cervix, that's this portion right here, very tightly closed up little area. This is kind of what keeps things out of bacteria and whatnot out of here and is the passageway down into the vagina. All right, the lower part of the uterus, the cervix and the vagina are all collectively referred to as the birth canal. All right, external genitalia. So you've got your mom's pubis, which is right here. This is right above the, the pelvic area, and this is right above the entrance to the vagina. Then you've got your labia major, which is the larger outer area around the entrance. And you've got your labia minor, minor which are the typically thinner, uh, entrance folds of skin around the entrance to the vagina. And you've got your vulva, which is just kind of collectively the, this whole area. All right. Uh, you've got your hymen, which is just a very thin membrane that stretches across a portion of the entrance into the vagina. Uh, typically is uh, stretched or torn during uh, use of tampons, um, intercourse, or even some physical activity like like riding horses or things like that. All right, so the perineum is the area right here between the vaginal opening and the anus. And that's where we actually grade tears during or after childbirth. All right, right here you've got your urethra. All right, that's where your bladder is going to empty out of. And then here you've got a kind of a mound, a gland of tissue and nerves, which is the clitoris. 
Now, talking about menstruation. So this is just a normal discharge of that, that blood, the epithelial cells, mucus, and tissue buildup that, that builds up every month in the lining of the uterus. Right? Menarche is the onset of the first menses. That typically happens around average, around age 12, but can happen younger, could happen later, it just depends. Uh, I think the youngest birth on record was like a six year old in South America. So, you know, it can happen very early or some women may not experience it until they're, you know, 15, 16 or so. Menopause is when the ovaries cease functioning and no longer produce ovaries, I mean, no longer to produce eggs. And then the menstrual cycle eventually will stop. Um, age here, once again, varies. Some women may have early menopause in their early to mid 40s. Some women may not go through menopause until their 60s. So it really just depends. But average is going to be er usually early 50s or so. Now we've got two primary phases of the menstrual cycle. You've got your ovarian cycle and your uterine cycle. So the ovarian cycle of it, this is days 1 through 13, which is the follicle phase. Okay. This is where the follicle is developing and is developing and releasing of the egg. Then you've got your luteal phase, days 14 through 28, and this is where it actually releases and now it has, it's releasing the hormones that would be needed to sustain a blastocyte during its period until implantation and the placenta can take over. Now the uterine cycle, you've got your proliferative phase, which is days 12 through 14, and you've got your secretory phase, days 14 through 28. Now ovulation is what occurs when you've got an egg that's released from that follicle. This usually is going to take place 14 days after the start of the previous menstrual cycle. The endometrium has been thickened and is prepared to receive the fertilized ovum and if an, o an ovum is not fertilized or is not released then the menstruation will happen. All right, this will last on average four to six days with a blood loss of 25 to 65 milliliters. Now, once again, some women may have menstrual cycles that only last two or three days. Some may have one, some women may have some that last seven to eight or so days. So it, it really just, um, it just depends on the individual person. Now, some more terms, uh, middle sprints. This is the abdominal pain in the middle of the cycle. Usually it's not severe. It may be like a sharp, crampy pain. Um, localized to one side and that's usually going to be on the side that they're ovulating from at that point in time. All right, Shouldn't be severe pain and it may switch side to side depending on which egg or which ovary is actually releasing an egg. But this is literally the pain felt when the follicle ruptures and the egg pops up out of the ovary. Now amenorrhea is the absence of menses and this can occur in a bunch of different things. You know, pregnancy, of course, most common one. Um, significant exercise can cause it to stop. Uh, a, a drop of body fat below a certain percentage, uh, extreme problems, stress, and of course anorexia nervosa, all of these things and can kind of lead to poor um, malnutrition and can cause some changes in the menstrual cycle.